Thanks for attending here. Uh, welcome, fellow web assemblers. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Python and how we can integrate Python into the component ecosystem that Luke talked so eloquently about yesterday. Uh, my name is Joel Dice. I'm a principal engineer at Fermion. Uh, one of my uh, big passions, even before I started at Fermion, was better polyglot uh, language support in the WebAssembly ecosystem. I actually showed this slide uh, in a previous presentation last year, uh, but I, I still like to, to look at it as sort of the vision, long-term vision to really fulfill the polyglot promise that WebAssembly offers so that you can take uh, source code written in any of these languages and more and compile it to Web, WebAssembly and target a wide variety of uh, hosts, uh, whether they be embedded or browser or uh, serverless, database, stored procedures, uh, all of the above. And frankly, we're not there yet. Uh, we're getting closer uh, year by year, uh, day, day by day. Uh, in particular, we'll talk about Python today. Um, uh, but we're, you know, at, at Fermion, we want to see all these languages uh, succeed. Uh, and uh, I use this opportunity to plug Kyle's Brown's uh, awesome uh, special interest group for guest languages uh, in the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, I'll have a link at the end of the presentation uh, if you want to get involved in that. Uh, but we're spinning up subgroups for Go, for JavaScript, for Python, uh, maybe Java here in the near future. Uh, so if you're interested in this topic, uh, please, please don't hesitate to join us. So the agenda today, first we'll talk about some of the prior arc, the solutions uh, for targeting WebAssembly using Python that exist already and uh, the underlying technologies that they use. Uh, we'll talk about comp composing WebAssembly modules. There's a variety of ways to do that, uh, each with their pros and cons. Uh, we'll look in detail at what Componentize does behind the scenes. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for a nice little demo that showcases, uh, in particular, the sandboxing capabilities that uh, Python provides for running untrusted code in an otherwise uh, you know, trusted environment. And uh, finally, we'll look at some of the next steps that uh, are required to make this really ready for prime time for everyday development uh, and how you can help out with that effort. So some of the prior art here, uh, it's built on a foundation laid by the CPython folks, uh, in particular Christian Himes and Brett Cannon and others who have uh, seen to it uh, to provide first class WASI support uh, in CPython, uh, supported uh, in large part by uh, WASI SDK uh, and other uh, critical projects. Uh, Christian actually uh, gave a great presentation uh, that you can look up uh, at KubeCon North America WASM Day last year um, to get some details on that. Uh, and then uh, I just had lunch with uh, Hood Chatham, who is leading the Pyodide project. Uh, and that combines uh, CPython, MScripten, and uh, a rather impressive library of ported packages. Uh, you know, pure Python packages aren't that difficult to run on CPython in MScripten or WASI. However, packages that have native extensions written in some combination of C, C++, and Fortran uh, can be quite a bit more difficult. And uh, I'll, I'll allude to that uh, a little bit later, um, uh, some of the challenges there. Uh, and some of the cool sub-projects that come, came out of that project are PyDi Build, which is responsible for cross-compiling uh, from whatever native architecture you're running on to WASI, or in this case, Subscriptin, rather. Uh, and then MicroPip, which is responsible for resolving packages, the dependencies in your pyproject.toml, for example, uh, and finding them either on PyPI or if they have native extensions, possibly an alternative index. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I'll mention about the CPython uh, WASI support uh, uh, is that uh, currently it's at tier three status. Uh, if you're familiar with the Python, CPython support status, kind of the most popular platforms are tier one. Uh, tier two has uh, somewhat relaxed criteria for, um, you know, uh, for, for being at that tier. And then tier three are maybe the lesser supported, less common platforms. Right now, WASI is considered tier 
three, uh, but Brett is working hard to graduate that to tier two, which involves more maintainership coverage uh, and better support in CI, official releases, that sort of thing. And I sort of, I'm doing this out of order, but I'll also mention uh, Mscripten. I'll talk a little bit more here shortly about Mscripten, but they've really paved the way with some uh, tooling conventions for dynamic linking, for static linking, uh, that have made supporting native extensions in WASI uh, even possible. Uh, so definitely build, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants here uh, in building this stuff. So, uh, so some people might wonder, you know, uh, Mscripten's doing stuff, Wazzy's doing stuff, you know, wh where's the overlap, what's the, what's the difference, uh, priorities, goals, that sort of thing. Uh, the way I would like to sum it up is, you know, for Mscripten folks, it's really about let's target Wasm uh, using exi with existing software, kind of fulfill the expectations of existing software, uh, probably written not for WebAssembly originally, uh, but rather for native, native systems such as POSIX and Win32. Um, and WASI wants to do all that as well, but we also want to kind of advance the ecosystem, create a, a better ecosystem. Uh, you know, uh, Brendan Burns talked about this 1970s legacy that we have uh, of, with POSIX. Uh, we want to move beyond that. Uh, there's, there's some definite warts in POSIX. Uh, it was designed for a different era, uh, different uh, sort of software development uh, environment. Uh, so, and of course, there's advantages to both of these. You know, the great thing with Mscripten is they're laser focused on a, a, a very specific goal, and they've been able to move very quickly with that, and thus uh, pave the way for some of the work that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, there's also advantages to the WASI approach, of course, uh, jettis jettisoning some of this legacy uh, baggage that we that we find in some of these native systems. Uh, another way of looking at it is, you know, Mscripten is about the browser. It's focusing on the browser and running uh, all types of software, desk, you know, things from like Figma to, you know, Photoshop to uh, a lot of traditional desktop applications in the browser. So we want to give all kinds of software a home in the browser. With WASI, yes, we want to do that, and we want to run it everywhere else which may prompt a question, you know, doesn't, you know, traditional software already have a home? After all, it was written for, you know, these native systems, these desktop systems. Uh, and the answer, of course, yes, it does, but that home is, uh, it needs a remodel, I would say. You know, it, the equivalent of POSIX, I would say, if it was a house, is it's got, you know, this 1970s stained linoleum countertop, and it's got carpet on the toilet seats, and we, we kind of, we, we want to update it. We, uh, we, the, it was a different era uh, back then, and so these non-reentrant APIs, this global state that's hard to keep track of, Arano, uh, all these things. This is like carpet on a toilet seat. We want to get rid of it. All right. So let's talk about composition here. WebAssembly uh, has a few ways of, of handling this, composing code. The first one is statically linking, in, and it's not really module composition at this point. This is before you even have a module. Uh, and this is where you use whatever your tool chain, if it's a compiled language, you're separately compiling a bunch of .o files, you're linking them together into a module. Uh, and this is sort of a foundational way of doing things. Even if you're using a high-level language, the interpreter for that language, the VM for that language is going to be built this way. Uh, and the pro is it's very widely supported. It's, it's like the original way to compose uh, code. Uh, and it's very optimal. Uh, there's no indirection. There's no global offset tables that you have to kind of call through or kind of uh, reference other data uh, using. Uh, but there's a long list of cons as well. There's code duplication. It's harder to patch a binary. Once you've linked in a library statically, you're not really going to tear that stuff apart again. Uh, and, and so auditing and addressing security issues can be challenging. There's no sandboxing. It's all one shared memory space, one set of global variables. Uh, and then polyglot composition is awkward. You're basically uh, using C as the lingua franca, passing pointers around. Uh, most languages can do this, but it's never fun uh, to, to compose uh, you know, a polyglot app this way. Uh, and so, you know, if you're familiar with sort of native development, you've heard of shared libraries or DLLs. Uh, and so uh, there is the equivalent of such things in 
uh, WebAssembly. Uh, it wasn't a part of WASI until very recently. Uh, that was part of the work that I had to do here. Um, but uh, Imscript, in, again, paved the way for this. Um, and some of the pros are uh, less code duplication. Now you can actually have multiple modules link against a single version of your Java interpreter or your C library, et cetera, or your OpenSSL. Um, and then it matches expectations of existing software since it's a par paradigm that's been around for native developers for decades. Um, and then it's also uh, auditable, auditable and patchable. Um, Still some cons here. Uh, we still don't have a good, it's all shared memory still uh, at runtime, uh, so there's not really any isolation. It's hard to virtualize APIs that use this uh, still C API or ABI uh, to pass pointers around and whatnot. So some of the really cool use, use cases where you want to virtualize a file system or virtualize uh, you know, uh, a random number generator for testing uh, become rather difficult to do to kind of, there's, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to insert layers between these. It can be done, but it's, it's not easy. Uh, and then uh, poly composition, you're still using the CABI, uh, not great, uh, hard to do high level things. And then versioning, if you've been around in the Windows world, you know, DLL hell, DLL hell is a thing. Um, trying to get the right version of the right DLL and upgrade them in place is not always easy. Uh, okay, and then the third way, which uh, you know, uh, Luke went into in great detail yesterday, is component linking, where you have a shared nothing boundary where you're passing sort of almost in an RPC style way uh, between components, but those components themselves each have their own memory, their own uh, global state, um, and uh, there's some, some big pros there. It's very virtualizable. It's easy to insert shims between modules or between a guest and a host. It's very polyglot friendly because they can each have their own runtime in their own sandbox. Uh, versioning uh, should be easier, uh, especially with the component model, because we have these high-level types, uh, functions that pass application-level types between them. Uh, it's easy to audit and figure out whether two components are compatible with each other. Um, uh, and then uh, sandboxing for security, isolating third-party dependencies in their own sandbox and not giving them access to sensitive data uh, can be a real, real boon. Uh, and help address the supply chain issues that become, have become top of mind for, for a lot of developers. Uh, but uh, the con is it's a new paradigm. Uh, you know, it's not what developers are used to dealing with when composing software, and so it can be hard to port existing software. Uh, and so since we're still building this ecosystem, building the foundations of this ecosystem, uh, th we don't have established package registries the same way we have PyPI or crates.io, et cetera. So uh, the question, you know, we see these pros and cons, uh, you know, the, the question might come to mind is which one should I use? It sounds like, you know, the, there's no clear winner there. And I would say the winner is all of them. Uh, I borrowed this diagram from a um, uh, shared everything linking uh, page under the component model repository on GitHub. Uh, but what we see here is uh, on the left, it's sort of the static dependencies where we have the, the application, depending on a couple of libraries, one that does you know, something with images using image magic, another that handles uh, zip files, um, and then those do, in turn depend on some C libraries, which then each of which depend on the C standard library. Um, and then, but dynamically, we see that when these modules are actually instantiated within a component, we have this, these red lines around these uh, 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 strictly enforced sandbox boundaries uh, with very clear interfaces between them. And we see each one has a libc instantiation so that the actual memory, the malloc heap, et cetera, and the global variables, each one gets their own version. The code on disk is all shared, but each one gets their own instantiation. Uh, and so here we get the sort of the best work, both of all three worlds. We're using static linking within each of these modules. We're combining these modules within a component using uh, shared everything linking uh, or dynamic library linking. And then we're composing the components uh, using uh, shared nothing linking. Uh, and so as an application developer, you can kind of, you can uh, isolate third-party dependencies. You can get the best of each 
uh, get the strengths of each of these composition models um, uh, and, and mitigate the drawbacks by choosing the right tool for the job. Okay, so at a high level, a componentized pi, uh, I mean, I say so myself, but I think it's a pretty straightforward uh, flow of uh, inputs and outputs. At a high level, you basically have to provide two things, maybe three if you have a native extension. In this example, we have a world that we want to target. Maybe it's a WASI world that's, um, you know, that's been standardized, or it's just something I want to target a particular platform, and it's got a WIP file that I can target. And I've got my app.py that targets that world, that uses the, the interfaces, imports the interfaces that the host will provide, and exports the functionality that the host will call. And then in this particular example, we also have a native extension that we know we're going to need at runtime. Uh, so we're going to use WASI SDK to compile that from C into a .so, which is really just a .wasm module with some metadata, a special custom section that gives, provides metadata about how to link this thing with other modules. Uh, and then we take all that input and we run it through, give it to componentized Pi, and it spits out a component that contains everything we need to run that module, including some stuff that we didn't provide that was actually built into componentized Pi, such as the CPython interpreter and libc and so on. And we'll, we'll see that in detail in a moment here. But hopefully pretty straightforward. You know, as a user, this is all you really need to know. You need to provide these things put them in the componentized Pi, you'll get out a component, you can then run it on the host that you were targeting with that world. And so if that's all you want to know and you just want to use it, you could just kind of tune out the rest of this presentation because now we're going to di you know, uh, dive deep into actually how it works behind the scenes. And there's quite a few steps. It's, uh, it's a bit complicated uh, as a matter of necessity because of the kind of the world that, you know, the legacy we have with Python and how uh, packages are, 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 are structured and so on. We need to accommodate all that. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to split this up into three stages, roughly, just because fitting it all on one slide turned into an, an eye exam, and I, I didn't want to subject you to that. But uh, at the, at the first stage is what I call pre-linking. And the goal here is to get all our modules that we're going to pack into a component, get all those ready and staged uh, to, be, to, to be linked together. And some of those modules, uh, in the native extension case, that was provided uh, you know, by the application developer, uh, maybe ex either explicitly or if they depended on a third-party package. We found that .so in a wheel, which is uh, Python's way of, 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 of calling packages. Um, and then, but we also have a few other WASM modules that are built into, for convenience, are built into componentized Pi that it will inject into the produced component. Uh, that includes a runtime.so, which sort of interfaces between um, so, uh, the WebAssembly code that we're going to produce here in a moment. I'll talk about that. And uh, the, the Python world via, and that uses PyO3, which is an excellent Rust library for interacting with CPython. Uh, CPython itself is packaged as libpython311. Uh, we've got libc, which pretty much all these other modules will depend on. This, that includes the allocator and the interface to the host for doing things like file systems, uh, environment variables, and so on. And then we also have this WASI Preview 1 adapter, which because libc currently targets, uh, the WASI SDK libc currently targets uh, uh, WASI Preview 1, and components need to target WASI Preview 2. This allows us to transparently adapt between the two. Uh, and then also, we've taken that WIT world and we've used a, a feature in Componentized Pi that generates bindings from that WIT. And the, that, those bindings have two parts. On this particular slide, we're just showing one of those parts, but there's, there's two parts. One is Python code, which you're going to essentially import into your uh, guest application to access that WIT functionality, call those uh, imported functions, export, and then it, it will provide a, if there's any exports, it will provide a, um, uh, abstract base class that you can inherit from and then implement uh, the export functions. Um, and then the other part, which we see on this slide, is 
some WebAssembly code that we are synthesizing from scratch based on that WIT world that handles the canonical ABI translations between the Python world and the, the host or the, the WIT world, uh, the, the canonical ABI. And so the canonical BI as, ABI as a refresher has concepts of uh, integers, uh, booleans, uh, lists, strings, records, variants, all these th sort of high level types. Um, and so we need to generate uh, WebAssembly code. We could have generated Python code, but it turns out more efficient uh, in the long run to generate WebAssembly code directly that will handle that conversion. And then it works in tandem with this runtime.so that handles uh, the bridge between to actually create the, um, on one end, create the Python objects uh, f corresponding to the, to the WIT objects uh, and vice versa. Uh, when, when lifting and lowering, uh, that, that's the terminology is, as, as we're converting between uh, uh, low-level WebAssembly sort of bytes in memory and uh, high-level uh, uh, Python objects. So, uh, so we, we feed a lot, all that stuff above the comp WIT component prelink into this prelink thing, and that so, so those are all our input.so's internally, and then those go into this prelink step, which then synthesizes two more WebAssembly modules. One is the main module, and this is the one that has a memory. All these other .so's, all the other WebAssembly modules import a memory, and so it's the main module that will export the memory, and that will be sized appropriately for the total amount of memory that each of these uh, uh, .so's above the line have declared that they need needed in their metadata that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then finally, we have an init.wasm, which is responsible for doing sort of like runtime uh, fix-ups for the global offset tables, for global variables. Sometimes you want to take the address of a global in, in the C code, and we need to uh, fix up uh, position-independent code so that it actually points to the right place at runtime. So that's what init does, plus a few other things uh, that I won't go into. So now we have all our core modules. All of these are core modules. There's no components in the picture yet. Uh, but that's what we'll get to next uh, in the next step, which is actually linking. So now we're taking all those .so's, those .wasms, they're all core modules. We're gonna feed them all into this WIT component link step. And that's going to do things like, uh, it's going to try to topologically sort all these modules so that uh, you know, the, the, the ones that have the fewest dependencies will come first, and then ones that depend on the earlier ones will, will, will be able to kind of, we'll, we'll be able to hook up all the imports to the uh, required exports. In some cases, though, we have cycles, so we have to break those cycles via an indirect function table. Uh, and so that's part of what the, this, this step is involved in. And then finally, we do this link, and the output of all this is a what I'm calling the uninitialized component. We're not do, quite done yet. This component uh, is ready to uh, be, have Python code injected to it, because you'll notice we haven't actually used any of the Python code yet. Um, so it generates this WASM file, and this WASM uh, file could actually be used at this stage if you wanted to kind of provide on the host file system a mount so that it could actually find your Python code and you could use it this way. But we want this thing to be self-contained. We want the interpreter and your application code and all the dependencies all to be bundled into the single component. And so that's the next step which is this pre initialization or pre-initialization, which uh, to be clear, all this happens at build time. And this is at the point where our Python co code comes in. And that includes the Python code you provided and any dependencies and a synthesized set of Python code. I called it world.py. It's actually multiple files, but let's just pretend it's a single file here. And that gets derived that's, this is the second part of the binding generation process that I mentioned earlier that generates the Python code that you're actually importing into your application. And all that gets fed into, uh, along with our uh, initialized component and the Python system libraries, uh, all the uh, battery included uh, you know, uh, Python features like the JSON and all that stuff that you expect to be built into Python, uh, that gets bundled in as well 
uh, to a component init step, and you may have heard of Wiser. Uh, that's been mentioned in a few presentations so far. Uh, this is the component. So Wiser only operates on modules currently. I've been talking with Nick Fitzgerald about maybe integrating this component support, but for now it's sort of a separate project. And this does com component pre-initialization. Uh, and this takes all this stuff and uh, essentially runs the Python interpreter at build time, running the top level of your application, so it's satisfying any imports and basically taking a snapshot once that, that init function returns, uh, taking a snapshot of the, the, the linear memory that was produced and then creating a new component that represents that snapshot. And that snapshot is ready to run, and then you know if it's a you know close to my heart as at Fermion uh, a serverless application, it's already resolved all the imports, it's already run some code, possibly loaded stuff from the file, file system at build time, and it's ready to go and handle an incoming HTTP request or a uh, you know incoming Kafka message or something like that in under a millisecond because we've already uh, warmed up the interpreter, it's ready to run. Before I move on, any questions about that? That was a lot of stuff, I know. Okay. Uh, okay, and it's demo time. All right, so the demo I'm gonna give, show you here is uh, based on a simple world here. Uh, this was actually prompted by uh, a gentleman on the Bikehood Alliance, um, Zulip, who had asked, you know, what are my options for sandboxing untrusted Python code in my app? Say I'm reading it off an HTTP request, or I, you know, it just, it came from somewhere that I don't trust, but I wanna run it, you know, in some safe environment. Uh, and uh, so I got to thinking, okay, how could we, how could we use this, what was then an in-progress componentized Pi with WasmTimePy, which is essentially a Python uh, wrapper around the WasmTime runtime, uh, and, and actually do what this, was, this gentleman's asking for. Uh, and so what I came up with was what I felt like was the simplest WIP file that would express this. Uh, if you're familiar with Python, it has uh, a distinction between statements and expressions, and so if, you're, if you wanna execute a statement, you have to use exec. If you wanna execute an expression, you use eval but they're otherwise kind of the same thing. So I thought, okay, well, we'll have functions for both in case you want to do both. Um, and, uh, and really it's just, yeah, it takes in a string, which is some arbitrary Python code, your untrusted Python code, and it will give you back a result. And when you run this in a sandbox, uh, you know, and we can restrict it also, we'll see in a moment that we can restrict how long it gets to run, you know, in terms of time. Uh, we can restrict how much memory it can use, and we can basically cut it off from all host access to the file system and so on. Uh, so that'll be fun. Um, so let's look at what this looks like at the guest level. So this is importing Sandbox. This is actually importing the code that was generated by componentized Pi from that WIP file we just looked at. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we're using that here. It produced an abstract base class called Sandbox with a capital S. And we're inheriting from that and we're uh, overriding the abstract methods uh, to implement the exports for this, uh, for this particular world. This particular example doesn't use any imports, I just realized that, maybe, but it, suffice to say, it does, imports work fine too. Should have added a log statement or something. Um, and so uh, basically what, what you would sort of expect, what it's doing here is it's evaluating the expression using the built-in eval or exec functions. And then for expressions, it's returning the result as a JSON string, which then the host can kind of deserialize uh, at, at its leisure. Um, and then it catches errors and it can raise errors. It, uh, there's some details there about how we translate Python exceptions into the wit contract, which just wants strings, uh, but kind of just simple details there. Hopefully uh, pretty straightforward. And then uh, we can look at the host, which is using uh, WasmTimePy. Uh, to do the same thing. So WasmTimePy has an equivalent generator to generate the host view of, the, uh, of that wit world, which where the imports and the exports are sort of reversed in terms of like who's calling what, uh, but it will look very much th very similar. Uh, there's more in here because I actually have like, uh, I've, I've sandboxed, you know, the, I've 
uh, implemented a timeout and a memory limit and so on. I'm not gonna go through this line by line, plus we have to parse command line arguments and stuff like that. Not super interesting. The one thing I will draw your attention to is uh, the, right now, we are, uh, WasmTime Pi does not yet support WASI Preview 2, even though WasmTime itself does. Uh, technical reasons, you can ask me later why, why that is. But so we have to provide our own sort of stub implementation, and that's what we're doing here. Most of which is just, we're, we're saying, you can't do this. You can't, you can't access standard in, standard out. You can't access the file system, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, uh, based on what was passed in on the uh, command line, we go ahead and call into this sandbox thing, which is gonna call into WASM time, uh, run the guest, uh, uh, call the exec functions, the valve functions, and then print out the results, uh, all in a very sandbox secure way. Uh, so let's go ahead and run this. I'm gonna peek at my cheat sheet here. This is all, uh, I'll have a link to it in the presentation. You can play with this yourself. Um, but I've already installed Componentized Pi and WASM time. Uh, I also have a, build, a WASI build of NumPy. There's no official build yet. This is very, a very new thing, so I built one for your convenience. Uh, it does use NumPy behind the scenes, and we'll, we'll exercise that. Um, so I did all that stuff, and now we can run the demo. So the first step is I'm going to run Uh, so I'm gonna run this, I'm passing in my, I'm telling it where, what directory to look in for the WIT files, I'm telling it which WIT world I wanna, uh, I wanna target in case there's multiple worlds involved, uh, and then I wanna, the subcommand is called componentize, guess.py is what we just looked at, so this is where we're telling it which module that we wanna uh, be the entry point for this application, uh, and then we want the output to go to sandbox.wasm. Uh, few moments there, there we go. And then the next step is we want to uh, generate the bindings on the WASM time side. One, two, one, three. So we're using WASM time bind gen, a sub-module of the WASM time pi project. We're saying, uh, and th this is, uh, we're, we're giving it not the WIT file here, but it's actually, we're giving it the sandbox WASM we produced in the previous step, and this will extract the component type so, uh, and generate uh, host bindings, host Python bindings from it. It also does some other stuff that I won't go into, but uh, uh, it basically prepares this component for running in WASM time pi. So we'll do that. It's uh, a little more verbose there. And then finally, we can run, uh, uh, we can run this, so the host pi was something I just showed you, and we're gonna give it a single expression which uses numpy, uh, and of course this is gonna use the C extension capabilities that we kind of saw in the diagram there to m multiply a couple of matrices. Uh, we just kind of hard coded that matrices, convert it back from a numpy list which can't really be uh, serialized to JSON to something that is a Python list, uh, and we'll run that, and there's the result. So that all ran in a sandbox. Another we thing we can do is uh, run something that deliberately triggers the timeout, the five second timeout that we've enforced here. So it's an infinite loop. Well, this is untrusted code. It shouldn't be doing that, misbehaving. So we will let that run for five seconds, and eventually, it will, uh, and it's a big ugly exception trace, so ignore that, but it, it timed out. Uh, so we're, we're secured that way, and then we also have a, uh, let me see if I can find it. Oh yeah, so I've also got a little thing that tries to allocate more memory than we're gonna give it access to. We limited it to 20 megabytes, so we're gonna do that, we're gonna try and run that, and we get a memory error. Um, I don't know why we don't get a stack trace there. I should have given a disclaimer earlier. I'm very new to Python, actually. Uh, I've done about, oh, stop, okay. People are telling me to stop. Okay, uh, so I've reached the end of this. Feel free to catch me in the uh, hallway for any questions, uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>